presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder. You're going to hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. <coughs> Death is defeated. The King is alive. <laughs> With everything inside of you, I raise a hallelujah. I go watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah. Yes, choir in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise, death is defeated. That's one of the uh, songs the worship team has done, I think just one time, but uh, it is just an exciting song and a great way to start the morning. <clears throat> I would say, wow, good morning to all of you. Sue and Gloria, I bet it is beautiful there. Carolyn, good morning to all of you. It is good to have you here and those that are across the country. Uh, um, 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 we got them in Florida, we got them in Georgia, we got them in Texas, we got them in Arizona, we got them in Colorado, we got them, you know, we got them all over the place. Uh, uh, Kansas and, and Missouri and and well it's just just it is great to be able to be connected to and in touch with so many people this is uh, uh, this is a busy day it's the last day of the week middle of the month nearly tomorrow's the 15th can you imagine we've gone through August pretty rapidly I don't even remember July now but uh, we are sitting here on day 85 of our daily Bible studies of our devotions together uh, so good morning, my dear, and uh, we've been in Joshua now for, I believe, 15 days, so uh, uh, it's just a great time. It's it's fun to be with you. It's fun to open the, the Word with you and, and learn with you. We've come all the way to the end of chapter 5 now. Pray for today. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a prayer request. This is the day that uh, the Joan Speck's family are holding the memorial for Joan. Uh, as soon as we finish broadcasting here <clears throat> and I get uh, get uh, changed and ready, I'll meet the family at the cemetery this morning for a yard for a uh, graveside service. And then this afternoon, uh, there'll be a very small service at the church at 2 o'clock. So pray for them and pray for the family. Uh, it's a busy day. Got a lot of things going. I want to uh, say thanks to Terry who stepped in as our hostess chairman. She's been in contact with the family and uh, will be there to oversee some things. And I know some of you uh, knew Joan and knew her well, and uh, but uh, she's she's happy now. I know the last several, well, the last several years, uh, she has uh, been ready to go home and uh, anxious for the day that the Lord would call her. So she went home on uh, June 20th of this year but because of everything going on and travel restrictions and all of that this is the earliest the family could get together to hold their memorial 
So uh, pray for them and uh, me throughout this day that we might just in every way honor God. Well, everything uh, apparently now is prepared to begin the conquest of the land. And the next scene that opens up, it opens up with Joshua, who we know is God's appointed commander, uh, not in the camp at Gilgal, but he's surveying, he's walking around and surveying the very city of Jericho. And he's going to meet uh, uh, the commander-in-chief in this uh, journey. So he's going to meet the captain. And it says, now it came about, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn. And uh, with his, let's see, with, it, uh, with, and with his sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went up to him and said, Are you for us? Or are you against us? Uh, and he said, no. Rather, indeed, I am, or I come now as the captain of the hosts of the Lord. Uh, Joshua fell on his face to the earth, bowed down said to him, What is my Lord to say to his servant? The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, what do you suppose he was doing there? Uh, well, he was going about the business that God had given him to do. He know that, knew that they were going into battle. He was developing, probably, thinking about a battle strategy, a battle plan, and he were, was surveying the, the city, the fortifications and preparation to launch a, a, an attack. And he'd never launched an attack like this one because he'd never come up a city, uh, up against a city like this one. Joshua was naturally concerned uh, about several things. Uh, first of all, he needed a, a plan of action. Just how is he going to go about attacking Jericho? Probably the best fortified city in Canaan. And they had little or no experience in besieging a city, especially the size or the, uh, the, the, the immensity of Jericho. Further, they undoubtedly lacked uh, the equipment. I mean, to take a city of that size in those days, you'd need a battering ram and catapults, scaling ladders, moving towers, all of those things that you see in some medieval movies and, and others. All they had were swords, arrows, and slings, and spears, which really were inadequate for the task, would you say? So how would Joshua prepare his army, and how should he go about taking the city? He must have felt the weight you know, of the world pressing on him. He knew what God had called them to do, and uh, he was doing everything he knew to do. We can't fault Jericho, or Joshua for being a Jericho, uh, for surveying the system. In fact, in fact, another leader, Nehemiah, did exactly the same thing when he was surveying the condition of the walls around the city of Jerusalem. Nevertheless, Joshua has an unexpected encounter because what he really needed at this point was a fresh encounter with a God whom he served because he needed to grasp afresh some important truths, one that uh, was equally vital as part of his preparation for victory and for power of God, just like we. When we face a battle of immensity or or, or not. It doesn't have to be that large. We need a fresh encounter with some very real truths. Let's pray together. God of glory and wonder, majesty of all majesties, mighty and holy, omnipotent, omniscient, the God who is everywhere, the God who is everywhere present, the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is yet to come. We humble our heart before you this morning, Lord, and we bow ourselves before the King of the universe. 
that we recognize when we go into Scripture, we are literally standing on holy ground. So we ought to, like Joshua, when he recognized it, just completely humble ourselves before you. Lord, we thank you for what you did in our life yesterday. We thank you for the way you opened your word to us and how you directed our, our steps and what we, what we accomplished yesterday. But Lord, that was yesterday. This is today. We need you fresh this morning. And as scripture tells us, Lord, your mercies are fresh every morning, day by day. We need that. We need the freshness of our God this morning that we might feast on you, that, Lord, we might drink freely of the water of life that you have given us, that our life would be sustained and held up by the power of your loving right hand. God, take us into your word today. Make it a feast for our souls recognizing that we do not live by bread alone, but, Lord, literally we live by every word that proceeds forth out of your mouth. Bless us and bring us into conformity to your will, Father, I pray. I pray under the authority, that great umbrella of, of my Lord and Savior, of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <coughs> Well, I'll try not to cough my way through this morning, but uh, uh, I'm a little bit uh, tight in the chest this morning. Uh, there's a couple of great truths that Joshua needed to renew in his life. One of them I would mention to you because uh, uh, we tend to fall into this trap a lot. We cannot experience victory today if we simply rely on yesterday's successes like Joshua who needed a fresh encounter for what he was going to face. We need daily a fresh encounter with God. We need to be fresh with him. We need to be current with him. We need to hear from him moment by moment. Like Joshua, all of us tend to get our eyes on enormous tasks facing us. Uh, and sometimes it can be the little tasks that pile up one at a time and they become very large. We miss seeing the things uh, that we need to see from God's perspective. Joshua is missing something, you know, as he looks over the city. I, I have always had this picture of Joshua walking around the city and scoping it out. And uh, people, uh, uh, maybe if he's scoping it out during the day, uh, they're looking and, and maybe he sees that one window on the wall that has a red, a red cord uh, hanging out of it. Uh, to identify the house of Rahab. He knew to look for it. So, uh, but he's scoping out the city. Perhaps he simply needed to be reminded at uh, some very important truths uh, for both clarification and for encouragement. I, I think he needed to understand for certain man's position. Uh, what is his position? With, with Joshua's mind, engrossed in his concerns about the task before him and feeling the weight of the responsibility on his shoulders he 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 looks up and there stands a man with a sword drawn i i wonder to, uh, sometimes you know as, as engrossed as he was did he see him immediately <clears throat> or he'd been standing there for a while before uh he caught joshua's attention i think that's kind of the likely scenario what kind of picture does this bring to mind? Uh, what does it mean? Standing <coughs> there with the uh, sword drawn, <coughs> any weapon drawn is a military position, a one who either is standing guard defensively or they're standing ready to go on the offense. Good morning, Pam. Uh, you bet. You you are absolutely welcome. We, we appreciate the privilege of being able to pray for Dan and uh, for his health. Uh, well, he sees that man standing there with a sword drawn and uh, suggested that he was there to fight. Well, he was either there to fight for or fight against Israel. 
So we come to the man's position. He's standing there. He's standing there, if you will look at the position that he's in. He's standing between Jericho and Joshua. By the way, you know what that's a picture of? It's a picture of intercession. It's a picture of the one who, who stands interceding for another. He stands in that awesome position of the intercessor, like Abraham did when he stood before this same figure, only he came with two angels, sat outside the tent of John, Abraham, told him the story. They walked together. He told him what he was going to do at Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham took the position of an intercessor between God and, and Lot. But you see, isn't the position of the intercessor, the mediator, if you will? We have no mediator between man and God except the person Christ Jesus. And here we have the one standing between Joshua and the problem. Is the problem solver. Verse 14 tells us that this man came as the captain of the hosts of the Lord, the commander of the Lord's armies. Joshua's response in 14b uh, was uh, the statement of, uh, of the captain in, in, uh, in, in, in verse 15, and it shows uh, uh, this is a theophanies, an appearance of Christ before his incarnation. Uh, based on the truth of John 1, 1 through 18, it is, you know, we could call it more a, a Christophany because it's Christ. A manifestation of the pre-incarnate Jesus, the Logos, the Word, the one who reveals God to us. If this is, was only a man or an angel, he certainly would have been repelled by Joshua's worship, but instead he really commands it. In Joshua 5 and, and, and verse 14, he, he simply he says, no. Rather, indeed, I come as the captain, the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, bowed down and said to him, What is my Lord to say to his servant? The pre-incarnate Christ appears to Joshua to teach him and to reinforce those vital truths that are essential for God's people, especially for those in positions of leadership, uh, which really includes all believers to some degree because we are a royal nation of priests. Joshua asks the obvious question when he meets up with him. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Get myself there. A little slow on the, uh, on the click time this morning. You see, it's a natural response to a man with a sword drawn to, and <laughs> express Joshua's concerns as well as his courage. No one from the army of Israel should have been there for evidently no order was given for anyone to leave the camp. So who was this stranger who suddenly appears out of nowhere? Joshua probably thought since he's not one of us, he certainly could be one of the enemies. Or maybe he's somebody that just came along to try and give us a hand. Who knows? That's why I asked the question. But a view of the answer given to Joshua, Joshua's question review, reveals a, a typical mindset that poses a threat and a hindrance to our effectiveness in our service to Christ. We tend to see battles that we face as our battles. And the forces that are marshaled against us, uh, they're against us. And they're and our individual causes, our concerns, our agendas, and even our theological beliefs and positions on doctrine. Don't we generally see when something is coming against us that it's our enemy? They're coming to attack what we believe or what we want? Now, in a sense, that's true. But uh, if we're truly standing for the cause of Christ, people will come against you. In fact, Jesus promised that uh, in this world we'd have tribulation, and that tribulation is personal. 
But in a far greater sense, it is simply not true. And that's the issue here. There is an answer given to Joshua, and that answer is no. I want you to think about the answer. <coughs> piece by piece for a minute. You ask the person, are you for us or against us? And he says, no. No what? No, you're for us? Or no, you're against us? You see, it doesn't make sense, does it? He says, no, rather, he goes on to explain, I indeed come now as the captain of the hosts of the Lord. See, the answer has really two parts. The first part is that answer, uh, the answer is seen in a flat uh, negative statement of either, either one of Joshua's options. The first answer is just simply flat neither. I'm not here for you, and I'm not here against you. Why didn't he reply? I'm, I'm here for you. I'm, I'm here for Israel. I'm, I'm on your side. Oh, the man with a sword drawn says, I'm not here to take sides. I'm not here to take your side. I'm not here to take their side. And the second part of the answer gives the reason. Indeed, I come now as the captain of the host of the Lord. In other words, I'm here not to take sides, but to take over as commander of the army. It's not a matter of taking sides. It's a matter of taking charge. And it's not a matter of me getting on your side. It's a matter of you being on my side. This is vitally important, and it lays down two principles that are foundational for all of life and our warfare against the forces of the world and against Satan. There is no question that the Lord was there with the armies of heaven to secure Jericho so God's people could possess their inheritance, possess the promised land, yet a certain perspective is vital if there's going to be success. It is not a matter of God getting on our agenda. We have to get on God's. It's not a matter of God taking up our cause. We must take up his cause. He is not here to support me. He is here to carry me. He's here to lead me. He's not here to take my advice. He's here to give advice, to give uh, uh, direction, to give counsel, to give orders. So principle number one is simply, it was not for Joshua to claim God's allegiance. Well, I guess I didn't put that up there. Uh, it is not for Joshua to claim God's allegiance for his cause, no matter how right and holy it might be. Rather, the need was for Joshua to acknowledge God's claim over him for God's own purposes. We tend to approach our battles and causes backwards. We turn things around and we try to marshal God to support us rather than to submit and follow him. Certainly, the battle was a joint venture. God and the people of Israel under Joshua's leadership as appointed by the Lord. But Joshua, as with, uh, as with all of us in the army of the king, must follow the Lord, submitting to his authority, taking our orders from him, and resting the battle in his hands because we realize it is really his battle as the supreme commander. Now, there seems to be no question that Joshua understood this as evidenced by his question. What has my Lord to say to his servants? Okay, you're the captain, you're in charge, you're the general, you're the king. What is it you, you want me to do? Now there's the right approach. Here he's asking the Lord for orders. It was surely then that he received the directions the battle plan for taking Jericho. Now I gotta tell you, as he listened to him, I got a feeling he must have gone, really? Really? R really? And trying to see it in his mind. Principle number two is as the one who had 
who had come to take charge, the Lord was also reminding Joshua and us of both God's personal presence and his powerful provision, the provision of a vast host. The promise of God's personal presence always carries with it the assurance of God's personal care. Likewise, the promise of his powerful provision always carries with it the promise of his infinite supply of power, no matter how impossible the problem may seem to us. There is more, infinitely more, than Joshua's army there. There was Joshua and his army, but there was also a myriad of angelic forces who always stand ready to do God's bidding and to serve his saints. Why do you think he emphasizes the fact that he is the captain of the hosts of the Lord? What is the host of the Lord? It is that vast array of angelic soldiers, if you will, with swords drawn, ready to do battle at his slightest command. Where do we get this? Well, there are three other passages can serve as helpful examples that we, we can grasp the issue here and its significance in our daily walk. I want you to understand why it, this is so important to us, both of these perspectives, that he didn't come to get on our side. We have to get on his side. Why? Because it's not our battle, it's his. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our enemies are spiritual, and they can only be defeated spiritually. And Jesus said the, that the world's going to hate you because they hated me. <clears throat> when the world comes against you, it seems very personal, but you realize who they're really coming against. They're coming against God. When they stand up and, and, uh, and, and denigrate the word, we take it very personally when they attack the Bible. But they're not attacking us. They're not really attacking the Bible. They're attacking God. We need to keep that perspective. One of the most favorite scriptures that I think uh, uh, I have is out of, uh, well, there's principle number one. I did put it up there. It is not for Joshua to claim God's allegiance for his cause, no matter how right and holy it might be. Rather, the need was for Joshua to acknowledge God's claim over God's purposes. Principle number two, as one who had come to take charge, the Lord was also reminding Joshua and us of both God's personal presence and his powerful provision, the provision of a vast host. Well, let's get to this scripture. You recognize the story, perhaps. Elisha is, is out in his tent. Uh, the king of Aram is making war against Israel. It says, now the king of Aram was warring against Israel. And he counseled with his servants, saying, In such a, such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the uh, uh, Ara uh, Arameans are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent uh, uh, to the place uh, about which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. Now the heart of the king of Aram uh, uh, was enraged over this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you tell me which of us uh, is, is for the king of Israel? And, and one of the servants said, No, my lord, O, o king. In other words, he's saying, Which one of you is a spy for Israel? What, which one of you is an infiltrator? He said, but Joshua, the prophet who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak from your bedroom. So he said, see, go and see where he is, that I may send and take him. And, and it was told him, saying, behold, he's in Dotham. And he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. So now you get the idea. Here's this great city. The city of Dotham is completely surrounded by the army of Aram. 
And it says, uh, where am I now? When the attendants of the man of God had risen early and had gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he says, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. You might take in your journals and write that prayer down. Open his eyes that he may see. And make that a prayer for us and a prayer for yourself. Lord, open thy eyes that I may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Joshua. They were not alone, and with them, uh, with them to fight for them was a host of God's angelic forces who soon struck the armies of the king of Syria with blindness. Wouldn't you love to have been that servant? There are times that I wish that, that, that God would just roll that, 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 that uh, shield back that, that, that veil that I could see, and we would see a host of God's army around us, doing battle for us, ready to battle for us. Well, the second scene is, is the very night that Jesus is betrayed. And you remember the statement in the comments? Jesus said to them, put your sword back in, in, in his place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not think I couldn't speak, I couldn't appeal to my, to my father, and, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12, 000, or 12 legions of angels? How then will the scripture be fulfilled, which is to say, uh, which says that this must happen this way? With the disciples reluctant and perplexed over the fact that Christ was going to the cross, Peter drew a sword and he struck a slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. You know the story. Jesus rebuked him and he makes it plain that he could stop this at any time. If he wanted to, he could call legions of angels at his disposal. In fact, I believe God, I believe it, it took the power of God to hold these angels back from coming to his rescue. Satan acknowledges the same thing when he's tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Uh, just quoting in part, uh, a part of Psalm 91, 11 to 12. He says, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways and they will bear you up in his hands and, and, and that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You see, Jesus had his, at his command the entire army of the hosts of the Lord. He is the captain of the hosts of the Lord. What those angels were witnessing there in Gethsemane and Jerusalem and Golgotha was their commander in chief being brutalized at the hands of sinful man. Can you imagine what power, what force it took to hold them back? Jesus had commanded, <coughs> commanded over an entire army of heavenly hosts, and they were straining at the bit to do the master's bidding. Finally, a passage of scripture that we looked at as we went through Hebrews. Remember what it says? Are not they, speaking of angels now, ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who fear him? And he delivers them? The psalmist says in Psalms 34 and verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamp around those who fear him, and he delivers them. My friends, if you and I had and had the ability to see as God gave that servant of Elisha, you and I would see at this very moment there is camped around us a veritable force of angels ready to do our bidding, ready to do his bidding, ready to, to, to do whatever necessary to, to protect and to deliver us. I think as... Paul was being martyred, or Peter, or 
any of those that down to the ages have been martyred. There was a myriad of angels around them, sustaining them even in the midst of their martyrdom, ready, if you will, to carry them home. This passage noted that God would send angels, his angels, down to the true loyal children of God and rescue them in, through, and, 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 and past the danger. His angels will lift us up and keep us from harm if we choose to trust him. And if God's purpose is that we would suffer and die for our faith, they are there to bear us up. Considering all this and going back to our text, we see the second reason the commander's description of himself as the captain of the hosts of the Lord. Then we see he's assuring Joshua of God's provision through a mighty angelic army. And what is Joshua's response? Well, it's simply this. Then Joshua fell on his face and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to me? You see, here's the lesson. Here's the lesson of our, uh, uh, of our needed response. The response of Joshua needs to be ours, one of worship and one of surrender. Joshua quickly got the picture. Joshua had been thinking of a conflict between Israel and the Canaanite armies, and perhaps he'd been thinking that this was his battle. Certainly felt the weight and the responsibility of leadership and commandership upon his shoulders. But after being confronted by the divine commander, he was reminded of the truth that he had heard Moses declare many years earlier when they stood on the banks of the Red Sea when Moses declared and said to the people, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Remember, as he raised the staff, he said, be silent and see, be quiet and, and, and be still and see the deliverance of God. Joshua learned afresh the truth that David would learn, and he would declare when facing Goliath, that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by the sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Perhaps Joshua went to Jericho with a great burden on his shoulders, laden down by the, 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 the near impossibility of the task he was looking at. But I believe that he walked a little bit higher on air as he went back. His heart lifted the burden gone because he knew that the battle had already been won because the captain of the Lord host was absolutely in charge. But that's not all. As an outworking of his worship and submission, we see Joshua's uh, inquiry and the inquiry of a servant looking to the commander for directions. Remember what he says? He just simply says these words. He fell on his face to the earth. He bowed down and said, What has my Lord to say to his servant? Do you remember Paul's response on the Damascus road when he came to realize that the glorified Lord was the one that he was speaking to? His question was, What shall I do, Lord? What would you have of me, Lord? What a comfort. And how encouraging to know that we never have to bear our burdens or face our enemies alone. Joshua was to know that the, ba that the battles ahead and the entire conquest of Canaan was not theirs. Theirs was to possess. Theirs was to obey. The conflict belonged to God. What is our part? Well, we're soldiers in the army his servants, for whom he abundantly supplies the whole armor of God. Surely these verses drive home the truth of Christ's preeminence and lordship, that he is the head of the church. Indeed, he is the king of kings and lord of lords. The passage also reminds us that God is not present to fight our battles or to help our cause or to jump in and rescue us when times of trouble come as though he is a genie in the bottle. Instead, it reminds us that the battle is his and that our role is that of a soldier servant. 
And we are here to serve him and to do his will and to follow him and depend on him completely. Well, then there's the commander's final revelation. The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet. The place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Does this bring to mind any other scene that you can think of? I can think of some 40 plus years earlier. Another one who would be a leader of the people of God. As God is calling him out and he meets this same God. Not in full battle array, but as a blazing fire, his glory consuming a bush. And when he sees it, it frightens him. And then out of that bush comes a voice, not to be afraid, to take his sandals off his feet. For the ground on which he was standing is holy ground. Joshua is experiencing the same encounter as his predecessor Moses. In these last words of the captain, there is a command. Remove your sandals. Remove that that is, 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 uh, is bearing, if you will, the, the dust and the dirt of this world. And then he gives the explanation, the place where you're standing. Well, you're in my presence. That's holy ground. Removing the sandals was a sign of a servant, the sign of respect and submission. The declaration of this place of encounter and revelation as holy ground calls attention to the special importance of what Joshua had just learned and experienced. God is not only the holy God, the God of our redemption through provision of a suffering servant, but he is also the holy one in our warfare through the victorious Savior. And as we relied upon him for our salvation, trusting him and abandoning ourselves to him completely, so we must trust ourselves in like fashion for our victories. We can only enter into battle so that we experience God's deliverance. And we can only do that when we remove our sandals and submit to his authority and his presence and his power over our life. Here we see that warfare for the Christian is a holy calling, but also it's a divine undertaking accomplished in those who humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. What does Peter say? Humble yourself, therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Sunday we will almost piggyback on this. When we look at, at that, that peace that that, that goes beyond all comprehension. That peace that passes all understanding. The incomprehensible peace of God. When we are able to take all of our cares, all of our anxieties, and cast them upon him. Isn't that exactly what Joshua did? He took his sandals off. He humbled himself before God. He's the servant. And he went away now not carrying the burden that he came there with. In this chapter, God, Joshua has encountered, uh, he, he, he has this incredible, wonderful encounter, this fresh encounter with the living Logos, the very revelation of God himself. It was an encounter that lifted the burden completely off of his shoulders. May we see how much we each need to be in the word with a listening ear, 
with our shoes, if you will, off our feet. Humble servants listening for the voice of the master so God can teach us the things we need to hear. So that the burdens we bear no longer become ours, but they become his. The battle we fight are no longer ours, but they become his. The challenges we face, no longer ours, they're his. The concerns we carry, as the psalmist says, becomes his concerns. Father, today, I don't know what is going on intimately and deeply in the lives of all of those that uh, have heard and been a part of this lesson or will be down the road. I don't know what Jericho's everybody is facing. I certainly know the walls that are in front of me, in front of my family. We can see them clearly as Joshua could see those walls that loomed in front of him. Many times, Lord, I spend time trying to figure how I can pick some mortar out of some bricks or how I can chisel away at the wall in front of me. When what I really need to realize is there is standing between me and that obstacle, the living risen Savior the captain of the host of the Lord. That even when I don't even know how to pray for those things are constantly making intercession for me with groanings <coughs> too deep to even comprehend. <coughs> I thank you. And Lord, where I have failed to yield and submit up to you, to your commandership, Lord, Identify those for me that they may be thrown down and cast down. That I will acknowledge with all of my, my faculties that you are commander-in-chief. The battles we face, Lord, they're yours and they are not ours. We are simply soldiers under the authority of our captain. Thank you, Father. Thank you for blessing us with this time together. Lord, I pray that you will be with me as uh, I, I'm with Joan's family today. And I pray, Lord, that you will just, just move in and glory both at the cemetery and at the memorial. And Lord, it'll be a time of rejoicing because this sister who suffered so much in this life is now rejoicing at the, around the throne of our King. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, <clears throat> it would be to your advantage today, I think, to take a walk around your Jericho. I think we probably all have them to one extent or another, to one greater extent than another. Sometimes our Jerichos uh, are very large and sometimes they're not too big at all, but they're there. They're an obstacle that stands between us and the possessing of what God wants us to have. Just like that mountain that Jesus said, if we have enough faith as a mustard seed, we could speak to the mountain, be it removed. The mountain is anything that gets between you and the will of God. Jericho's the same thing. There's a whole land out there for them to possess, but Jericho stood in the way. They could not leave that city and take the rest. They couldn't bypass it. That would have put the enemy at their rear. It had to be taken. You cannot bypass the things in your life that seek to defeat you. And I know we all have things in our lives that constantly raise themselves up to defeat us. We battle them, we work, and, and what I need you to do is identify them and then see Meet the captain of the host of the Lord there in front of your Jericho and listen to what he has to say. He'll speak to you in a fresh and new way. Then you might want to call somebody and incorporate them in on your battle. Say, listen, I may have never told you this, but I have a Jericho. 
There's an obstacle that just keeps pounding at me. Somebody you can have confidence in and say, I want you to pray that I am able simply to listen and obey what the captain says in the midst of this battle and be an encouragement and let them encourage you. Well, we'll leave for now. Busy day ahead of us. Uh, this is Friday, so I'll see you on Sunday morning, and then we'll be back for picking up on Joshua chapter 6 on Monday and moving through. I pray you have a great day, and God blesses you through the weekend. Serve him. Man, find an opportunity this weekend to bless him and do that which he calls you to do and obey him. Listen to the captain, folks. We love you, and uh, we'll say good day to you. God bless.